A couple of weeks ago, uh, you may have been able to be there with us. We had our baptism service. And one of my favorite things about the baptism service is people share their testimonies there. If you had the chance to go down to, to Camp Gideon where we did our service there, you had a chance to listen in on the, the different stories of how people found Jesus. You know, I love to see the differences in their stories, even though they all have a couple things in common. Everyone's story is just a little bit different of how they met Jesus along the road of life. Today we're going to talk about the testimony. And if you ask the, the average person on the street what a testimony is, their mind would, would probably go to someone in a courtroom who has witnessed an event. Probably someone who is testifying firsthand to something that they have witnessed. And when we begin to move that thought and that de definition into the Christian testimony, or as today we'll move into Paul's testimony, we're, we're speaking of someone who is testifying to the things of Jesus Christ in their own lives, and they're telling that to other people. This is what I've witnessed, this is what I've seen, this is who I was, and now this is what Jesus has done for me. This is the testimony we're going to talk about today. We're going to see it in Paul's life. We're going we're gonna to see Paul's testimony. And, and what's interesting about this testimony today is that he gives this as his defense before the crowd. They're really putting him on trial. He's in front of people. We're going to see this. He's going to constantly be on trial. And the first thing he uses to speak about himself or, or to give his defense is his testimony about Jesus Christ. You know, I, I actually love this picture today because we're going to see this picture, and we'll get into that in just a moment, but he, Paul's going to stand before this crowd who is hostile, and a few minutes before had called for his life, and they were beating him, and he's going to stand there before them and speak to them about what Jesus has done in his life. And it's actually going to, going to follow an outline. I'll give the outline to you ahead of time for those of you who like to write them down. The first point is who Paul was. He tells them who he was. The second point is who Paul found, so who he found. And the third one is who Paul was called to be. So this will be his testimony. This will be the outline of the message today. But this is also Paul's defense before the hostile crowd. Let's pray here as we begin. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open up your word. And Lord, we pray over this today. It's a, it's a larger text as we incorporate all of Paul's witness and his testimony here before the crowd in Jerusalem. And Lord, we pray over that as we, as we listen to him tell his story. And Lord, I pray it will impact our own lives. Maybe there's people sitting here that don't know you yet, Lord. May they hear this testimony and come to know you. And Lord, those who do know you, who have begun to walk down that road of life with you, may they be bold in sharing who they were and who they are in you, Lord God, to the people around them. We pray for that, Lord, for that boldness that we'll see here today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to follow along, I'm not going to read the whole passage today. Again, this is a larger text today, this testimony that he gives. But it's found in Acts 21, verse 37, and we'll be reading all the way to Acts 22, 21. You can follow along in the, back of, in the blue Bible that's in the back of the pew in front of you. It's actually on page 931 if you want to follow along that way. You know, it's important to understand the setting, and I, I gave you just a little bit of a glimpse at it, but I want to tell you the whole picture at this point. For those of you who haven't been here with us in our Acts study that we're walking through this year, so Paul has returned to Jerusalem from his third missions journey. And all along the way, he knows there's going to be difficulty when he arrives in Jerusalem. And when he gets there, that's exactly what he's going to find. Because once he's greeted and a few of the brothers welcome into their homes, there's, there's a rumor that he finds out that's circulating through Jerusalem, even among the believers and even in the temple, there's this rumor circulating about Paul that he has come to destroy all the, the Jewish customs and the law of Moses, that he is out preaching against those things and trying to destroy them. That's the rumor that has been circulating about Paul. And when Paul finds out about this rumor, he, he wants to put that to rest. He wants to prove that all of that is, is false. And so he goes to the temple to try to make sure that this rumor doesn't get out too far, but it's already too late. 
And when Paul arrives, this, this rumor has gone out before, and, and we talked about this last week. This rumor began with just one person leaning over to another and saying, you know, I have something to tell you about Paul. And we talked about it last week, it's really slander because everything about it is blatantly false. And whoever started it, it was done with an intent to harm. And so, so Paul has gone into the temple area. He was trying to attach himself and show that he was purified. And when he is there, they accuse him of a second thing. That he has brought a Greek named Trophimus inside the temple courts, inside the holy place where he's not supposed to be. All these accusations are false. But, but at this point, the, the crowd is so worked up over these two accusations that they begin to form a mob. It's why last week we talked about the sins of the tongue. And we talked about them. The, the sins of the tongue are so easily to fall into. You know, we, we wouldn't go out and murder someone tomorrow. And, and we talk about these bigger sins in this world of, of, of hatred and, and bitterness. And, and we talk about drunkenness. And, and we talk about sexual sins all the time. These are, these are what we call big sins. But there's also sins in Scripture like sins of the tongue that so easily people can get caught into. Sins of gossip and of, of slander. And, and we even included flattery last week in the sin of the tongue. And, and I had a lot of people talk to me about this in the last couple of days. And so I wanted to make sure we're, we're clear on these. That all of those, there is an intent to harm when you're doing them. When we talk about gossiping, it's talking about secrets about someone that actually happened that you really shouldn't be talking about. You, you shouldn't be spreading those around. There's an intent to, to spread word about someone. When we talked about slander, it was something speaking something blatantly false about someone with the intent to smear their character around. That's what's happened to Paul. And we even defined flattery. It's really false praise. We talked about these that last week. You know, James 3, 8 to 11 says this, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and our Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? This is what we talked about last week. And, and when we left that, I don't want to preach that whole message again, but it was really important. When we left that last week, I, I told you guys this. You know, so often we hear sermons and we say, man, I know a guy sh who should really listen to that sermon. It's, it's our nature. We, we know someone who's a little worse than us, and we say, man, they should hear that. But I asked you to do this. I asked you to look at that from your own perspective, just from yourself, and inspect your heart. And ask yourself, do I do any of those things? That was what we asked last week, because we saw that in our text. The rumor had gone out about Paul, and it caused him so much damage. And when he gets into the temple and they give this second accusation that he's brought a foreigner inside the holy place, they drag him violently from the temple and begin to beat him with the intent of killing him. It all started with a rumor. It all started with one person leaning into another and saying, I have something I want to tell you about Paul. And someone leaning in and telling, saying, yeah, go ahead. I want to hear about this. That was the story last week. And it led us into this setting of Paul being abused and, and the crowd is pressing in on him. They're striking him with their fists. They're beating him. He is on the ground at this point, and he's really saved by the Roman soldiers who run out of the Antonio Fortress, and when the mob sees the soldiers, they stop beating him for a moment, and the commander grabs him and wants to find out who he is. And it says the crowd, there, there's one person shouting one thing, and another person is shouting another, and it says the commander can't even get at the truth. You know, isn't that what rumors do? You, you can't even get to the truth, and someone ends up being harmed. That's our story. 
This is our setting for today when we hear Paul's testimony. The mob is so violent against Paul, it actually says in our text that he had to be carried by the soldiers back to the fortress, back to the barracks, it says. It's the Antonia Fortress. They're carrying him. The mob is so violent against him. This is our setting where Paul gives his testimony. I wanted you to have that picture in your mind, especially if you weren't able to be here with us last week. This brings us to our first point, because Paul's going to speak about who he was. You know, when we, when we talk about a testimony, we've got to begin there, who we once were, and that's exactly what Paul's going to do. But at first, Paul has to clear something up. He has to clear, and we'll call this sub-point A, and I, there, it'll be on the screen behind you for those of you who like to take notes. He first has to clear up who he's not, because we'll actually see a third accusation against him. The first one is that he's trying to destroy all of Judaism and, and preach against it. The second one was that he brought Trophimus into the holy place. And the third one that we'll see here is that he has led a rebellion against Rome. Here's what it says in verse 37 to 38. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, remember they're, they're carrying him, because the mob is trying to strike him as he goes by. And he said to the tribune, this would be the commander, may I say something to you? And the commander says back to him, do you know Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? The commander is shocked when Paul speaks Greek because he has been told he's someone else. He's surprised he knows this language, and the reason he's surprised is because he believes Paul is an Egyptian, and a very specific Egyptian, a man who led a revolt against the Romans. There's a historian who wrote about this named Josephus, and Josephus would write, an Egyptian raised a seditious party, promised to show that party the fall of the walls of Jerusalem, and they went to the Mount of Olives, and he said, when the walls fall, we're going to enter into the city upon its ruins. And Josephus goes on to say, Felix the Roman went out against him with his soldiers, killed 400 of them, and took 200 of them prisoner, and the rest were dispersed. And when that took place, this Egyptian who led the revolt was able to make his getaway. The commander here believes Paul is that man who led this uprising against the Romans, and he's surprised that Paul knows Greek. And my opinion is when we read that, the commander has been told that probably by the mob when they were shouting different things when he's trying to get at the truth. Probably someone went over to the commander and says, you need to do away with this guy. He's the guy who led the revolt, that Egyptian. Another attempt at taking Paul's life. You know, as you, as you look at Paul's life and what he does, I'm amazed at the boldness that he has because he's been beaten at this point. And I think from sitting in our shoes today, you know, we have plans that we're going to do after Sunday and we have things on our mind. We forget to place ourselves in the shoes of Paul, don't we? But right now, Paul's eyes are probably watering from the bruises that he's taken, from the beating of the crowd. He is bruised all over. He'd have brush burns. They just drug him out of the temple and through the streets and were beating him. And he says, you know, can I speak at all? And I think there's, there's something here to it because despite all the bruising and despite his eyes watering and there'd be swelling already on his body, I think he laughed a little bit here. I think he chuckles. And he says to the commander, no, I am not out to destroy all of Judaism and destroy the law of Moses. I didn't even bring someone into the holy place that was a Gentile. And I wasn't the guy who led a revolt against Rome. Paul says to him, I'm not even Egyptian. I'm actually Jewish from Tarsus of Cilicia, and he humbly and respectfully asked to speak to the whole crowd. And when Paul goes to speak, he uses the Hebrew language this time. 
And when he uses the Hebrew language, the whole crowd quiets down. And I, I make mention of that to tell you this. As Paul is giving his testimony, he first uses Greek, which helps him with the Romans to prove he's not an enemy of Rome. And he uses the Hebrew language among the Hebrew people to show him he's not an enemy of them. He's, he's one of them. I love his use of language. When we talked last week, we talked about the power of words. They can be used to heal and to help. They can also be used to harm. And here, with the use of language, Paul is sharing in words that people understand. He's speaking this boldly and in words that are understood. So Paul corrects who he is not, then he moves to who he was. This is our second sub-point. So we, we've established he's not this Egyptian revolutionary, and, and our second sub-point is who he was. And, and I'm going to use one word to describe him because it will come up time and time again in his testimony here. I'm going to use the word persecutor. Could have used a couple words. Could have said sinner, or, but persecutor will come up time and time again. Here's what it says in verses 3 to 5. Born in Tarsus in Cilicia, brought up in this city, Educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strictest manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who were with there who were there, and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. Paul repeats again where he was born. And this is important, because what he's doing is he's connecting with the audience. He even says, I was trained as a Pharisee under Gamaliel. And they would understand this. They know who Gamaliel was. He's connecting with the audience, and he's saying, those of you who are zealous for the law, so was I. I know exactly what you were taught. In fact, I, I was probably more zealous than all of you for keeping the law. I knew every law, and I kept all of it in my own human effort. And then he says who he was, this persecutor. And he says, in, in all of my pride of wanting to follow all the law, anyone who wasn't doing, I went out and persecuted them. And he said, I particularly persecuted those of the way. If one of you want to know who I was, you must understand I was a persecutor of Christians. This is Paul's testimony when we talk about who he was. He talks about the persecution. And when we're first introduced to Paul, it's actually in Acts chapter 7 at the, at the martyrdom of Stephen where, where Stephen will be killed. And it is there, as they're throwing stones at Stephen, they place their cloaks down on a man named Saul. This is Paul before his name was changed. And he was there giving approval to his death. And it says, after that, a great persecution would break out. And Paul is the, the ringleader of this persecution. He's going around from house to house and, and going around through the cities. And if he finds anyone who is a Christian there, he would take them and he would arrest them and he'd put them on trial. This is who he was. He writes in 1 Timothy, he says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Or some translations say, of whom I am the worst. He's talking about who he was. A former persecutor of Christians who went out of his way to stop all that the things that the kingdom of God was doing in the name of Jesus. He even went out of his way to get papers from the high priest. He's saying, you can ask them yourself. You know, when we talk about our own testimony, and we're going to talk about that at the end in the application section. You know, I think some of us who were saved many years ago can get away from who we were. Now, in Jesus, we certainly are supposed to do that. We don't wallow in the old filth that we were once a part of. The prodigal son, when he was in the hog pens and he was in that mess and he was in sin, he got up out of that and he left it and he ran into the arms of the father and he was cleaned up and he gets a new robe, right? We don't have to live in that old mess of filth and of sin anymore. 
But I would ask you too, to never forget who you once were. Because we look back not with guilt, but with gratitude for what Jesus has done in our lives. I think, I think so many people today live their life in guilt. And what guilt does is it drives us to work harder in our own human effort. And what we must do is live in gratitude. We can look back on what we once were and say, I'm no longer that way anymore. Thank you, Jesus. And we can live without the guilt. We can live in grace and with gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. And that's what Paul is doing. He's not going back to the old hog pen of sin. He left that a long time ago and ran into the arms of the Father. He wears a new robe. He's been washed clean. And he doesn't live that way anymore, but he remembers how far he's been taken. No, I'm not an Egyptian terrorist, but I was a persecutor of the way. Paul tells us clearly who he was. And then he moves to who he found. Verse 6 to 8. This is in the 22nd chapter. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light shines down from heaven and shone all around me, and I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, remember this is before the name change to Paul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. So he's going the wrong way. He's heading to Damascus to persecute more Christians. And this light shines in from heaven. And he knows instantly it's something from above. Who are you, Lord? He asked the question. I am Jesus of of Nazareth. He will have an encounter with Jesus along the road. As I was reading some of the background to the text this week, I was struck by something that was written in Matthew Henry's commentary. It says this in there, condemned sinners are struck blind as the Sodomites and Egyptians were by the power of darkness and it is a lasting blindness like that of unbelieving Jews. But convinced sinners are struck blind as Paul was here. Not by darkness, but by light. They are for the present brought to be a loss within themselves, but it is in order to their being enlightened as putting the clay upon the eyes of the blind man was the designed method of cure. You know, that really made me think. I, I, I read that. I was reading some of the history of this, this passage. And it was talking about that, that darkness and the light. And it talks about some people were struck by the light and it was temporary so that they would come and be able to see. You know, through Scripture, especially in John, you read of the Pharisees and Paul was one of those. And, and they believed they could see. And they had to be taught by Jesus that they were actually blind in the spiritual sense. And so Paul is traveling down this road to Damascus. He's on, on, going the wrong direction. And Jesus goes after this man. He'll be a chosen instrument and he'll be struck by the light. You know, when we, we look at our lives, our own individual lives... You've got to understand that Scripture paints this picture of two paths in life of which we can travel. There is an easy way that can be traveled. And we are told in the Sermon on the Mount that this easy way is a wide path. It is easy to travel it. Many people are on that path, and that path ends in hell in eternal destruction. That's what it says in the Sermon on the Mount. And there is another path. There's only two of them. There's another path that is a difficult path. It is a narrow way. Few people are finding it, and it ends in eternal life. 
This picture we see here is Paul on the way to Damascus. And when we move that into the spiritual, we begin to see that Paul is traveling the wrong way. And Jesus comes and shines a light into his darkness and says, there's something that you need to know. If you continue on this path, you will end up in an eternity in darkness and hell. You know, many people don't like to preach those types of messages. We, we used to call them fire and brimstone messages. Those are messages of truth. That there are so many people across this nation, if they do not find Jesus or on the way to hell and eternal punishment, that is very clear in Scripture. But there is another way. And if we find Jesus as Paul does and the light shines into our lives, there is another way of which we can travel. It is not the easy way. It is a narrow way. But it is a blessed way in the end. For those who go down that path. You know, the other thing I note as we move, continue to move this into our own context today, and many of you have heard Paul's testimony a number of times in your life, and, and if you look at this context, it's interesting to see that some of the people who saw the light didn't really understand what was happening. And isn't that so true? When, when the message of Jesus is proclaimed, there, there is some people who, who get it, who, who see the light, and who, who take that message in. I would call that the ones who soften their heart to the message of Jesus. And there are others who do not understand it or even who reject that message of Jesus Christ. We see that picture as, as the hardening of the heart through Scripture. And we see that today on this road. Some people didn't understand the voice that was speaking, and, 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 and Paul, he ends up having this encounter, and others around him aren't sure what's taking place. You know, I, I say that because maybe you're sitting here today, and you're not sure where you're at with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've known some of the stories, maybe you've attended church, but it just hasn't settled into your heart. Church attendance is a wonderful thing. It can help you along the way, but that does not mean that you're saved. It is when Jesus shines a light into your heart when you're walking along that path and you come to repentance in Him and you turn to Him as your Lord and your Savior and you place Him first. That's salvation. And after that, then you want to be a part of a church body. You want to be among the people. You want to be worshiping God. You want to work together. You want to come together as a flock and help others to do that. But it begins with the light shining into your life. So here we see Paul as he's sharing. He, he's sharing in a language that is understood. He's sharing boldly. And he's speaking who he was and and who he had found along this road, I have found Jesus. And you know, the next thing that begins to be asked is this question, what shall I do? Here's what he says in verses 10 to, 20, to 13. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? That's a very important question. Here's what Paul says, and I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came to Damascus. And one Ananias, now here's a touching story. So he gets up, he says, Lord, what shall I do? And, and the Lord ends up using Ananias. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who live there. Notice he, he puts that in there because he's speaking to this crowd of Jews and he says, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and I saw him. You know, this is a picture of grace and mercy. So Paul is heading down the wrong path, and he's, he's living his own life, the life of self. This is what I'm going to do in my own human effort. I'm going to try to achieve what I'm trying to achieve. But then Jesus comes into his heart, and he's struck with this blindness in the physical. He can't see. He's led by the hand, and he needs help. And he says, what shall I do, Lord? 
It's a question all of us must ask each day. Lord, what shall I do? What do you have for me today? This is what Paul is sharing with us today. He, he's, he's now a person who is not going to say, what do I want to do with my day, but what does the Lord have for me? And the Lord says, you're going to go into Damascus and, and you're going to be humbled because you're going to be led by the hand. You know, Paul was this guy who was, who was leading people. He was leading on the charge and the persecution. People look up to him. And now all of a sudden, he's going to be led by the hand. And he goes, by the way, I'm going to take you to Ananias. And you know, when Paul was going to Damascus, I picture him having a list of people he knows he's going to get. He has a list already there before him of all the Christians that live in Damascus and he's going to pull it out of his pocket when he gets there and he's going to go to each of their homes. He's going to drag them out of there and he's going to drag them back to Jerusalem where hopefully they'll be imprisoned and beaten and maybe worse. And I picture this, that Ananias' name was on the top of the list. And the Lord says to him, you know, that guy you were going to get in Damascus, you're going to go see him, and we're going to have him pray for you. You know, Ananias asked the Lord probably more than one time, Lord, are you sure that you want me to lay hands on him? I do want to lay hands on him, but not in the type of laying hands that you're asking me to do. And it's a picture of, of not only humility, when we stand before God in repentance and now He's leading us by the hand, but also of grace and mercy on both sides because, because Ananias knows what Paul is coming to do. And honestly, if this guy was coming to persecute your friends and family, would you really want to pray a prayer of blessing over him? Would you really want to pray for his eyes to be open? You know what, Lord? Why don't we keep him blind for a little while? But this man, Ananias, he too has been with Jesus. He too has seen the light. And when we come to know Jesus, we don't live the way the world does anymore. The world says when someone does something wrong to us, we wrong them back. When someone is, is, is angry at us, we can get angry back. That's justified. When, when the world says that someone's bitter against us and gives us the silent treatment, well, I'm going to give them the silent treatment back. But this isn't how it works through the lens of Jesus Christ. He calls us to a different way, a difficult path. And here Ananias Praise for Paul. Tears would have been coming out of Paul's eyes when he prayed for him. And he probably said, Ananias, I have something to admit. I was coming to get you. And here this guy lays hands on him and prays for him. And Ananias, out of love, says, you know what, Paul? I'm no longer who I once was either, thanks to who I found. Point three, who Paul was called to be, 14 to 16. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins and call on his name. Paul is called to be the proclaimer of the gospel. He's called to take the message of Jesus. He's, he's called to be a witness for Jesus. This word martis, it's where we get the word martyr from, someone who, who dies for what they believe in. Stephen was a martyr for his faith. And now these people are, are dying to what they once were and they're going to preach about Jesus Christ to everyone they see. It's what Paul is going to do. A, a witness, as it's used here, is a person who has seen or knows something and they give evidence to it concerning its truth. That's what Paul's going to do. And in verse 21, he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. I had the privilege of helping 
two weeks ago with Scott's World Celebration of Life. And one of the stories that touched me most that his family shared with me was one I didn't know about him, and I shared it two weeks ago. It was how he touched the lives of other people. You see, when Scott gave his life over to Jesus, he, he was saved out of a world of sin, and, and, and some of the guys that he once knew began to see this life change that was in him, and they, they began to come to church with him as well. And they told us that two of the people ended up being saved and, and becoming pastors and, 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 and began to follow Jesus Christ. It's such a picture of what we're talking of today, of this testimony and this witness. That those of us who have found Jesus Christ begin to, to live a life that other people are seeing. You know, and when we, we talk about the application point of this passage, I want to talk about two things today. And the first one, before we talked about sharing our testimony, is this. I believe Christians underestimate the power of a truly lived out faith. What I believe our world is really hungry for is seeing Christians just live out their faith. And I found a story that is incredibly touching about that because, because when people begin to see faith lived out, they begin to ask a question. They begin to ask, what does that person have that I do not? And I read this story this week. It, it was one that D.L. Moody told a long, long time ago, and it is a, a touching story. And it speaks about living out your faith. And, and this story was about this young man who enlisted into the army. And this young man, before he went to bed every night at his bedside, he would, he would kneel down beside his bed, as, even as a young boy. His, his mother had taught him. And he would, he would pray to the Lord every night before he would go to bed. He'd kneel down with his hands and he'd look up to heaven and he would pray to God. And he enlisted in the army. And he was now living in a barracks full with many people. And he said the first night that he came in there, there was a whole bunch of guys there and some were playing cards and some were doing other things. And, and he decided to live out his life like Daniel did as an exile. He continued to live out his faith the exact same way he'd been doing before. And before he went to bed that night, he knelt down and he began to pray. And he said the guys at the card table began to shout curse words at him. And he said it got so bad in the next few minutes, one guy even threw one of his boots at him and told him to stop praying. The next night he decided to pray again. And the same thing happened. And the jeering got a little worse. This got worse and worse for a couple days and finally he went to see the chaplain. And he said to the chaplain, I am not sure what to do. And he said, they're taunting me even worse. And the chaplain said, you know, they are entitled to the barracks just as you are. He said, but you don't have to pray in that way. You don't have to pray kneeling and with your hands out and looking up to heaven. He said, why don't the next night, why don't you just lay in bed and close your eyes and, and pray to the Lord? And so he went and the chaplain didn't see him for a few months and never heard anything about it. And a couple of, of, of months had gone by and the chaplain finally sees this young man and it recalled this story to him and he says, I need to ask you how everything's going for you. I haven't seen you back. And he said, the first couple of nights I did what you told me to do. He said, I crawled into my bed and I, I pulled my covers up and I just closed my eyes and I, I prayed to God. And he said, after a couple of days of doing that, I felt like a whipped dog. And he said, so I decided it didn't matter to me if they were going to make fun of me for praying in public anymore. And so after that, I decided I was going to kneel down and I was going to pray and live out my faith just like I always had. And the chaplain said, well, how'd it go? And he said, well, some things happened over the last couple months and now everyone joins me in prayer. You know, I think... The culture that we live in today, it is difficult to live out our faith. We have tremendous freedom, but it's also challenging. And I believe our world needs to see a faith lived out of grace and love and mercy that points to Jesus Christ. And I believe our world is desperate to see that today. 
you know, in a world that struggles with truth, we know what truth is. And as much as we say that, that people are moving away from truth, I don't think so. I believe there is a hunger among people across our nation to have the truth proclaimed to them today. There is a hunger for people to simply read the word of God. That is still there. People talk to me about it all the time. The urgency of getting into scripture and reading God's word. The urgency to go out and pray for our friends and our family who do not know Jesus. You know, I believe that sometimes the best witness is the simple things of someone who just loves Jesus and is going to live that out each and every day. The second thing when we talk about our witness, we talk about living out our faith, the second thing that we see is the sharing of our testimony. And we've read about Paul and we, we've read his outline of sharing his testimony. He said who he was, he talked about who he found, and he talked about who he is called to be. And some of you say, well, it's scary to share my testimony. I don't even know what to say. Maybe we could have the pastor come and do it for us. He's trained in those type of things. And I would tell you this. If you have found Jesus and the Holy Spirit resides in your heart, you know enough to share your testimony of what Jesus has done for you. And you can go out in a boldness in that. You know, I think I have it somewhere over here. Matthew 10:20. Paul's actually living this out. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious of what you're to speak or what you're to say, for what you are saying will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. That's exactly what Paul is living out. If you know Jesus and the Holy Spirit resides in your heart when that happens, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you have repented of your sins, you walk in His way, the Holy Spirit is in you and can give you the wisdom to speak. And I'll tell you something very simple that you can say for those of you who still struggle with that. Share who you were. Share what you found. And share what God has called you to be. That's all Paul is doing. He stands before this angry crowd who actually wanted him killed and beaten. He stands before them and, and he shares who he was, what he'd found in Jesus Christ, and what God called him to be. That's all he does. And it's something that we're called to do as well. Paul isn't the only one who was called to be a proclaimer of Jesus Christ. Everyone who knows Jesus is called to take that message out. Sometimes we just live it out. Other times it's time to share our faith and say, this is who I found in Jesus. I'm going to have our, our helpers come forward. We're going to take communion today here as we close. And this is something that we do among the body of believers. And if you haven't been here before, the way we take communion is, is that our ushers will, will release you. They'll dismiss a row. You'll come down front. Uh, you'll take a piece of the bread. You'll take some of the juice. And then so you'll walk down the front aisle. You'll go back to your rows through the outside aisles and sit down. We'll partake together after reading some words together. Um, but that's how we take communion. And we take it very seriously. We're told to examine our hearts before we take communion. And so I, I ask that we do that now. Let me pray over us here. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word and to listen to Paul's testimony. And Lord, we are reminded that when we know you and have turned to you, we too have a testimony. And our testimony too is powerful when people hear it. And Lord, I pray over this today, and as we, as we do something among the body of believers, among the family, we take communion together. Lord, I pray over this right now. I pray over those who, who are here. I pray for boldness in, in sharing their faith and living out their faith today. We pray for these things. And Lord,
as we partake of communion, let's be reminded of what this truly is. And thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.